What up, Chaos Nation? I'm your host, Ethan Sands, and this is another episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. I'm joined by your favorite beat reporter, Chris Fedor. What up, Chris? What's going on, Ethan? How are you, man? Well, Chris, it's going to be a late night, but definitely a fun one. We're recording this episode after the Cavs' overtime victory over the Rockets on Monday night. Chris, the Cavs are 2-0 without Evan Mobley and Darius Garland so far some folks have written off the team after the injury news what are your thoughts on how the team has played over these last two games well I always try and put things in perspective right Ethan you know that about me you've been working with me long enough to realize that it certainly helps that their first two games have come at home and it certainly helps that it's in the middle of what was already going to be a winnable stretch Atlanta stinks Atlanta's defense has been terrible throughout the course of the year, even worse lately. And the Houston Rockets have won two games away from Houston. So they're just a different team on the road than they are at home. They play different on offense. They play different on defense. They don't have the mega stars. It's not Boston. It's not Milwaukee. It's not Philadelphia. And it doesn't mean that I'm taking anything away from the Cavs because look, To win any game without Darius Garland and Evan Mobley is going to prove to be a challenge. They're going to have to play extremely well at both ends of the floor to overcome those two key absences. But it certainly has been advantageous for them to be at home with the schedule lightening up a little bit. In saying that, the thing that stands out to me beyond the obvious of Donovan Mitchell raising his level, he had a career high in assists in the first game against Atlanta, And then tonight, he was spectacular, especially in the third quarter, scoring 20 points in the third quarter when the Houston Rockets couldn't even guard the Cavs at all and resorted to hack at Tristan with seven minutes to go in the third quarter because they had no defensive answers for what the Cavs were doing. The thing that stands out to me beyond the obvious, Ethan, is that everybody knew that when Darius and Evan went down for an extended stretch, that guys were going to get opportunities. And you just don't know how they're going to respond to those bigger opportunities. Is it going to be too much for them? Are they going to be put in positions where they're just not ready for those moments? They're not ready for that workload. They're not ready for extra shots to come their way. Are they being asked to do a little bit too much? Are they being asked to do more than what they're capable of? You just don't know when you're shifting Isaac Okoro from the bench to the starting role. You don't know when you're shifting Sam Merrill from a bunch of DNPs to 20 minutes. And the fact that these guys have stepped up and they have helped fill the void, that's what stands out to me the most. JB has trusted his depth a little bit more. And these guys who have gotten sporadic playing time at the beginning of the season have stepped up in different spurts throughout the course of the game and made it an impact. Yeah, Chris, and let me throw some numbers at you. Sam Merrill played tremendously against the Rockets. 19 points, which is a career high. Five made three-pointers, also a career high. Isaac Okoro is actually 5-1 with the Cavs this season when playing 30 or more minutes. That's a weird stat. It's a weird stat, isn't it? It's a weird stat. And somehow the Cavs, I believe, are 4-3 and when he starts. Anyway, looking at what the depth of this roster can do, Isaac Okoro playing the small four, playing as the highest rebounder along with Karis LeVert tonight, proving that they are playing bigger than their size allows or says that they are. And then Sam Merrill over the last stretch, starting in overtime, knocking down a three, taking a dribble drive, and making a layup on a bigger defender. Something I did not think I was going to see from Sam Merrill. I thought his game was limited to beyond the three-point line. But these guys have stepped up in a tremendous way. And I got to get your take on who do you think continues this level of success for the long haul? Because we know Darius Garland and Evan Mobley are both going to be out for at least a month and Evan Mobley nearing two months. Yeah, so here's the thing, Ethan. It's hard to say because I just don't know that it's going to be the same guy on a nightly basis. We're talking about situational players. We're talking about role players. And in some cases, like with Sam Merrill, like with Tristan Thompson, 
we're talking about specialists where what they bring is going to be the same, but whether the Cavs need what they bring is going to be different. You understand what I'm saying? So if you think about the start of tonight's game, the Cavs went with the starting five that they unveiled the other night. It's probably going to be the starting lineup that remains in place for a majority of this stretch without Darius and Evan. It's Donovan Mitchell at the point guard, Point Mitchell, with Max Struess at the two, Isaac Okoro at the three, Dean Wade at the four, and Jared Allen at the five. But Dean Wade didn't play at all in the fourth quarter because the coaches felt like the game called for something different. Dean Wade didn't play at all in overtime. Karis LeVert didn't play at all in overtime. Now, my sources tell me he's on a bit of a minutes restriction, but the other part of it is JB felt like there was something that Sam Merrill brought to the table with his movement shooting, with his floor spacing, and with his ability to just like create havoc on the court. The defense has to pay attention to Sam like everywhere he goes when he's running around these screens in a different kind of way than some of these other guys on the roster. And JB felt like, because of the way that Houston was defending the Cavs throughout the course of the game, that that skill set was going to be required, especially in overtime when points were going to be at a premium, when guys were getting tired, when the offense was getting bogged down in the fourth quarter, and it worked out well. So it doesn't mean that the next game against Utah, that the Jazz are going to be playing the same kind of way against the Cavs, and then Merrill's going to be needed just the same. It may be a Craig Porter Jr. night on Wednesday. And then Thursday, it could be more of a Dean Wade night than a Sam Merrill night. So I think there's going to be some flexibility within that. But I'll say this, Ethan. Members of this front office, the minute that Darius and Evan went down, nobody was excited about that at all. And I don't want people to take this out of context. But there was some, okay, we kind of get to see what we have with some of these back-end players that we have invested in as an organization. You know, the Cavs have groomed Sam Merrill into this role from the G League. Then they gave him a multi-year contract. Then it was him continuing to try and work his way up the depth chart. But they invested in him. This organization has invested in Craig Porter Jr. as well. This organization has invested in Dean Wade. And there's a little bit of, hey, we've got an opportunity to see what these guys can do with an actual opportunity. They haven't been getting consistent playing time. Let's see what happens when they do get it. And there was excitement in the organization about Sam Merrill specifically because at least one member of the front office referred to him as a weapon. And I think you saw a little bit of that against the Rockets. Everywhere he went, he was commanding the defense's attention, and he was able to knock down threes, clutch threes in some timely moments. So if I had to say, like, he's the one who, based on his minutes in the first two games during the stretch, he's the one who has earned it a little bit more moving forward. They've said it a lot. They've said it a whole bunch. It's going to be by committee. It's going to be by the guys that they have. It has to be. Because nobody is going to be able, no one person is going to be able to take over the role of Evan Mobley or Darius Garland. That's just not how this roster is built. But looking at how the defense has kind of rallied around each other on the defensive end, especially when Jared Allen went out today with foul trouble, we got to see them play an extremely small ball lineup and still being able to fight in the inside. I mean, Sangoon is going to be a problem against a lot of different defenses, but the Cavs were able to minimize his production on a good amount of the game, especially when he was put into foul trouble as well. What are you looking for this defense to do over the next stretch to continue to play at this level? To me, the important thing in the NBA, Ethan, is to just be able to play different styles and to be able to use different kinds of lineups. Can you win playing big and small? Can you win playing fast and slow? Can you win on offense? Can you win primarily on defense? And the Cavs have shown at different points throughout the course of this season that they can win a bunch of different ways. And it's not always going to be the same formula. The general foundation and the general principles are in place but the formula is probably going to change and it's probably going to change even more during the stretch without Darius and Evan. 
And I thought it was really, really important for them to be able to find a workable defensive small ball lineup. Look, their defense wasn't terrific tonight. The Rockets scored 39 points in the third quarter. They scored 34 in the first quarter. The Cavs finished the night with a defensive rating of 115.2. That's below their standard. That's below what they had been doing over the last two and a half to three weeks. But like without Evan Mobley, it's just important for them to find different five-man groupings that they feel like they can get away with, that don't put too much pressure on Jared Allen on the interior, that don't put too much pressure on this particular defense. And I thought in spurts, against the Rockets and against the Hawks in the first two games of this transitional period, that they were able to at least find enough of those lineups and those combinations. And and I think it's interesting that Isaac Okoro is going to be at the heart of that. He's going to play some three. He's going to play some four. Dean Wade, the same kind of situation. Because when you do not have Evan Mobley playing next to Jared Allen, You're going to have to find other ways to go about it on the defensive end of the floor. Do you think there's anybody on the Cavs that likes doing the dirty work more than Isaac Okoro? No, I don't think so. I don't think there's anybody on this roster that loves playing defense more than Isaac Okoro. (laughs) That's who he is, right? That's how he's carved out his niche in the NBA. He's not somebody who's going to go out and score 20 points a night. He's not going to have six assists every night the way that he did against the Rockets. He's just going to have to find a way, any way possible, to impact winning. And it's going to be ugly at times. It's going to be grimy. And in these kinds of slugfest type games, that's where Isaac is going to be the most comfortable. Have you ever seen Fast and Furious? Which one? There's like eight of them. Yeah, I mean, I think there are nine at this point in time. But one of the more recent ones was where Dominic Toretto and it was the the British dude Shaw. And they're like on top of a building. And then like, I think Dominic Toretto thought it was going to be a street fight. And the Shaw dude was ready for something else. And the Shaw dude is like, oh, you thought this was going to be a street fight? Guess again, sort of thing. And I just think of Isaac Okoro. When games get into a street fight type thing, he's just like, bring it on. That's all me. I can thrive in this kind of environment. He had a sneaky, sneaky 18 points against the Hawks. And he had 11 tonight against the Rockets. Back-to-back double figures, yep. Back-to-back double figures, and the Cavs had eight players in double figures tonight. We've been talking about community. We've been talking about playing as a unit. We've been talking about playing together. Eight double-figure players is going to be huge. And it's not going to happen every night. But this was a testament to show that Hey, everybody on this team can shoot it. Everybody on this team can go get you a bucket. It might not be in a set. It might not be in the half court. It might not be by them putting the ball on the floor and going to get in it by themselves. But everybody can do what needs to be done on the offensive end to help win games. The last time this franchise had eight players that scored in double figures in the same game was 2016, seven years ago. And not only that, Ethan, everybody that played tonight made at least one shot. Everybody but George Niang that played tonight had at least one assist. So they were moving the ball. They were making plays for themselves, making plays for others. And everybody that played tonight, all 10, scored at least three points. And nine of the 10 players logged about 18 minutes or more. So, like, that's JB trusting his depth a little bit more. And it's almost a situation now with JB where it's more of all hands on deck in terms of approach. He can't lean into Darius Garland playing 40 minutes, right? He can't lean into Evan Mobley playing 40 to 45 minutes. He's got to do things in a different kind of way. He's got to approach it as a coach in a different kind of way. This is going to test him a little bit more. He's got to make the right gutsy calls. Hey, look, to open up overtime, Ethan, he made a gutsy call. He didn't go with Karis LeVert. He didn't go with Dean Wade. He went with Sam Merrill to open up overtime, and it worked out well. Sam Merrill, as you said, he had that driving bucket, and he had that three-point shot, and he helped open up the floor and create a little bit of more movement for the Cavs. But those kinds of gutsy decisions 
JB is going to have to be right on more times than not because some of the security blanket stuff has been pulled away from him during this stretch, being without Darius Garland and being without Evan Mobley. So yeah, the guys have to step up and they have to deliver when their number is called, but it puts JB under the microscope a little bit more because some of his successes and some of his mistakes will show a little bit more because you just don't have those kinds of quote unquote erasers out there the way that the Cavs have in the past. Facts. All right, we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, we're going to answer some questions from our subtexters in the newest rendition of Hey Chris. But before then, become a Cavs insider and interact with Chris and myself by subscribing to Subtext. Subtext is where you can leave questions, and on Tuesdays, we'll answer them in our Hey Chris episodes. Sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. All you have to do is text the word STOP. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from myself and Chris. This isn't just our podcast, it's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. Subtexters, you know we love you, and we appreciate you guys reaching out even though it's late. But we're going to get into some of these questions. All right, Chris, with Darius out, is there any communication with Ricky Rubio that you have heard of? No. I mean, the only level of communication that the Cavs have had with Ricky is is very, very small. They're trying to give him the space that he needs. Obviously, he needs space. That's why he stepped away. He wants to focus on his mental health and well-being, and the Cavs want to respect that, obviously. J.B. Bickerstaff has communicated with Ricky from time to time during this absence, just via text message, just to check in via text. But it isn't anything extensive, and there still is no clarity from this organization on when Ricky will return, if Ricky will even return. And here's the thing, Ethan. It is already December. The last time Ricky Rubio touched a ball in a meaningful situation was probably August, four months ago. So let's say that he's ready to come back to the team. Hypothetically, he's ready to come back to the team right around the trade deadline. Like that would be six months, six months of being away from the game. And that's just way too long of a stretch for the Cavs to even think that they can get anything of value on the court from Ricky or that he can all of a sudden join this team and crack the rotation and get meaningful playing time or anything along those lines. So I think the chances of Ricky Rubio being helpful to this team on the court in any kind of way is slim to none. Honestly, Ethan, like this can sound cold and I don't want it to come across that way. But the NBA is also a business, and and we as reporters have to talk about every layer to every situation. I think the Cavs are more likely to try and dangle Ricky Rubio's contract to a team that's looking to free up some salary cap space moving forward into the future and see if they can just use him as a trade chip because he's probably not going to help this team maybe ever again. Right. And now to the next question that also includes a point guard that the Cavs haven't seen in a while. Is there any update on the recovery of Ty Jerome? I know that we've talked about in recent podcasts that Ty Jerome stayed home, stayed in Cleveland over the past road trip so that he could do some work and get back into the flow of those things. I also know that in a recent photo from one of the latest games at home that Ty Jerome had a walking boot on. Is there any further recovery analysis or updates that you might have, Chris? Talked to a source before the game about this specifically, and it's just not improving. The ankle is just not improving. And the source said they wanted to make it clear that it was not a setback per se, but each time he just gets to a point where he can't cross a certain threshold to get clearance, to feel better, 
There's a lot of frustration. The team is a little bit confounded by what's going on with his ankle. And obviously high ankle sprains are very difficult to deal with to begin with. But this one has led to a little bit more frustration. If there's any good news, any at all, it's that the Cavs aren't even 30 games in. And if he can find a way to get over the hurdle when it comes to his recovery and the recovery doesn't plateau anymore, there's still enough of a runway for him to kind of like get back into the rhythm, find his place within the team and maybe be ready to help them down the stretch run and into the playoffs if he can work his way back into the rotation, if there's still a place for him in the rotation when he comes back. They could certainly use him right now, given this extended stretch without Darius Garland. There's a level of maturity to his game, a level of comfort with his game, a level of readiness to his game that is at a little bit of a higher level than what exists right now with a rookie in Craig Porter Jr. Ty Jerome has just played more basketball in the NBA. He's seen more defenses in the NBA. He's had to deal with the ups and downs of game situations and how to run a team and all that different kind of stuff. But I just don't sense that the ankle is healing to the level that the Cavs were hoping and Ty was hoping at this point in time. For sure. And as of right now, Donovan Mitchell is stepping up as de facto point guard. Yeah, but you got to find what you're going to do in, in those other minutes. Like, Ethan, Donovan Mitchell played 45 minutes tonight. Insane. It's December. You you can't have him go 29 straight minutes in a December regular season game to close out just to beat the Rockets. You know what I'm saying? Like, there has to be moments, even without Darius Garland, there has to be moments during this stretch that JB pulls Donovan back a little bit and doesn't allow the 40-minute threshold to be a consistent thing. The other night against Atlanta, it was very, very similar for Donovan as well. The other night against Atlanta, the Cavs won, and they needed that win, but Donovan played 41 minutes in that game. If it's Levert in stretches to be point Levert, if it's trusting Craig Porter Jr. a little bit more and allowing him to play through his mistakes and deal with the growing pains that come with playing a rookie in a meaningful NBA game, then so be it. But Donovan going 29 straight minutes just to finish off the Houston Rockets, man, that's just a little bit too much. That's something that's going to catch up to him and it's going to catch up to this team. So they've got to find somebody else beyond Point Mitchell to take some of those minutes away from Donovan. Especially because it was the Rockets. We talk about Donovan Mitchell's minutes. I think realistically, he can average between 35 to 40 minutes a game. What do you think he should be averaging to be able to withstand this 82-game season? Yeah, and it's not only the minutes, too. The minutes is a big part of it. It's how hard are those minutes? How taxing are those minutes? How much is he responsible for? on the offensive end of the floor, and on the defensive end of the floor. Fred Van Vliet of the Houston Rockets leads the NBA in minutes this year at about 38. Beyond him, Tyrese Maxey, Luka Doncic, Jason Tatum, Kevin Durant, the guys that you would expect. I think if Donovan is more around his season number of 36, that's something that the Cavs would be more comfortable with. I think that's something that's a little bit more doable. I don't think they can get into a situation, though, Ethan, where they're looking at how can we survive short term and then have that come at the expense of the long term. And I know it's hard to find that balance. It's harder now to find that balance. And you might be saying, well, there is no long term. There is no long term outlook for this organization without Darius and Evan. But all they have to do is survive uh, until really Darius gets back and then they have to figure it out when Evan's going to come back too. But I think around his season average of 36 to 38 is probably where I would want to try and keep Donovan, especially because those are hard minutes and he is so responsible for so much of the offense right now at this point in time. All right. Last question from the subtexters. Last question for the pod. From one of our most loyal subscribers, Andrew from Cleveland Heights. He even listed himself as the texter. (laughs) (laughs) 
his question is, from an organization standpoint, do you think they give JB a pass on judgment of his coaching acumen of this team, or should they give no excuses and judge JB on his coaching overall? I think when it comes to evaluating JB, it's everything. It's what he's done to get this franchise to this place, right? This is a team that is respectable. This is a team that is good in the Eastern Conference. This is a team that coming into the year, fans, media members, and smart people around the NBA viewed as a contender. JB laid the foundation. JB got a young team with dynamic personalities and a whole lot of talent to buy into a defense-first approach, a defense-first way of winning, which is rare in today's NBA. These guys want to shoot threes, and they want to make shots, and they want to get buckets, and they want to put up, you know, 125 to 135 points or something like that. So when it comes to evaluating JB, it's about everything. You can't sit here and only say, well, it's all about the playoffs for JB, or it's only about his in-game management, or it's only about the culture that he put in place. No, it's about all of that mixed together. And then the Cavs have to determine... Is JB the right person to take us where we want to go ultimately? I still get the impression, Ethan, that the Cavs want to see JB in another seven-game series, in a playoff environment, with high pressure, high stakes, and see if he can learn from his failures from last year's playoffs against the Knicks when he was outcoached by Tom Thibodeau. And JB can't show those things to this front office right now because it's December and you can't replicate all that kind of stuff in December. You can't replicate all that stuff in March. You got to get into that playoff series. So I get the sense that the Cavs want to see how he's going to handle that environment and what he learned from those things. But look, like if things aren't going the way that the Cavs want them to go, if this team is quote unquote underachieving, no matter the circumstances, if this team feels like it's not reaching its potential, with him in charge, then I think the front office is going to have discussions about it, and they're going to try and determine whether sticking with him is the right thing or moving on from him is the right thing. But I just don't think that it's, how do you handle this stretch without Darius and Evan? And I just don't think it's, okay, how do you handle when those guys come back and all that kind of stuff. I think it's an entire full-scale evaluation about are we better off with him or better off without him? And I think we'll have to wait and see because we'll have to see if the Cavs make it into the playoffs, they make it into the play-in tournament, if they get it past the first round and all those things. But right now, they're just focused on winning regular season games. And I know we've talked about in the past that the Cavs don't need to chase wins, but right now it feels like they just need to keep winning so that they can keep morale up and keep the understanding that they are still in the race for play-in, playoff, and championship contention. Yeah, and I don't think he's going to get a pass, Ethan, because he's doing this without Darius Garland and Evan Mobley, two really, really important pieces of this franchise. But at the same time, I will say that I don't think he's under as much regular season pressure as he probably was a couple of weeks ago. And I don't think the expectations for this team, top to bottom, are at the level that they were a couple of weeks ago. And it doesn't mean that the front office or the main decision makers have given up on the season or given up hope that the Cavs can still be a playoff team. It's just an understanding that this team as currently constructed without those two main components is a little bit different <laughs> and is not as equipped to hang with some of the most formidable teams in the Eastern Conference the way that people expected them at the beginning of this year. So if anything, some of the pressure has been alleviated. It doesn't mean that the Cavs can flounder and they can sit around 500 or they can go on an extended losing stretch or something along those lines. But the level of pressure and the expectation is now different because of Darius and Evan being out. All right, and that'll wrap up today's episode of the Wine and Gold Talk podcast. But remember to become a Cavs insider and interact with myself and Chris by subscribing to Subtext. Sign up for a 14-day free trial or visit cleveland.com backslash Cavs and click on the blue bar at the top of the page. If you don't like it, that's fine. 
all you have to do is text the word STOP. It's easy, but we can tell you that the people who sign up, stick around because this is the best way to get insider coverage on the Cavs from Chris and myself. It's not just our podcast, it's your podcast. And the only way to have your voice heard is through subtext. Y'all be safe. We out.